for 30 minutes. But uh, what we'll do is we will certainly allow plenty of time for Q&A. So, uh, you know, after we finish, um, you know, all of the uh, uh, everything we need to do with the products, we'll make sure that we got sufficient time to make sure that we have all your questions answered. Um, we're going to cover the what really you know PAM is and the evolution. Now, you know, from a partner perspective, you may have seen you know a lot of presentations of uh, you know SB PAM and really talking about the evolution of PAM. But what I'm also going to explain is why is this important? Why do we show this to customers? You know, and how does this ultimately affect the sale? Um, we'll talk about the competitive market. And you know who the you know the main players are. Um, talk about some of the differences, um, and also you know how to position uh, you know against you know some of those competitors, and also you know when you're in net new. Um, I'll give a short demonstration of the products, and as I said, you know we will have um, plenty of time for Q and A at the end. So let's talk about the the evolution, you know, and really you know, why that's important. Now, we've got to go back, um, about 18, 19 years, you know, which is what I call the, the big banger, Pam. You know, this is really the inception. Um, and it was all around vault-based access at that time. Now, the reason why it's important and why we always show this at the start of, you know, each of our SB Pam sessions is the fact that every vault solution or every um, you know, competitive PAM solution is built around the vault. And it's important to, you know, for people to understand why is that, you know, how did the vault, you know, sort of come to be and why is it so, you know, ubiquitous, you know, across um, all of those different vendors. Now we got to think of the use cases, you know, back around 19 years, it was very simple. You know, there was a lot of legislation, a lot of compliance, mandates coming out where people had to adhere to certain standards to make sure that you know they, they were doing their due diligence in terms of auditing and control and really the low-hanging fruit at that point was all of those built-in accounts administrator root ssa and the vaults were built around that whole process of change and release now for the first 10 years this really was, you know, what we considered to be PAM, and it was called privileged account management, or sometimes it was also called SAPM, shared account password management. Now, as time moved on, you know, basically the things matured in terms of uh, capabilities. Um, the expectation for customers wasn't just to say, well, give me a password. It was, well, log me in automatically. I want users to do their job, but don't expose them to the credential, add this extra layer of security. Now, the problem is, is, you know, Pam actually does a good job of achieving that use case. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't do a good job at clearing a lateral movement attack surface. And oftentimes it can make it worse. So when we think of, you know, a typical use case, so Bob, the admin here, you know, is logged in the little, you know, uh, circle with the, the white arrows, uh, you know, represents a proxy. So he's logged into an endpoint using a password he doesn't see. Um, at the end, the vault rotates his credential and then he gets kicked out of the proxy. The problem is all of those accounts that he was using still retain their privilege. So, you know, a vault or a traditional PAM solution is going to give Bob access to his Bob dash admin account. But the problem is, is, you know, even when he's not using it, that still represents an attack surface, especially when it looks for lateral movement and we look for things like pass uh, the ticket attack. Now, what we've done with this solution is said, look, there's context. You know, there's some places where you do need to vault credentials, you know, and that's typically going to be those original use cases, administrator, root, SSA. Absolutely. You know, those aren't used day to day purpose. So, you know, what you're doing here is really just making sure that they are properly rotated and they're there for break glass. But the biggest challenge is all of these, you know, dash A's, dash admins, ADM, any, you know, account that's used for day-to-day -day purpose and typically domain accounts. Now, the reason why it's important to go through these slides is that when everybody thinks of PAM, they think, oh, cyber, psychotic, beyond trust. And they think, yeah, it's got a vault. So they think the vault is synonymous with PAM. But really what a vault does is it doesn't remove a privilege. All it does is it just manages a problem. It doesn't address it. Now, what we do 
is we implement a different process. And if we look back, uh, you know, really how we've been doing things over the last few years, um, everything is around you know, single use accounts. So, you know, an administrator might have access to five, 10, 50 different accounts that are assigned to them. Each has a delegated permission. So essentially they're single purpose accounts. So, you know, the vault gives them access to, you know, this account to do this task. It gives them access to another account to do another task. Now, if we overlay the analogy on top of this, this is where, you know, we, we start talking about taxis, which seems an odd thing, but it's a great thing that really works to overlay the problem. So if we translated the way that we currently do PAM to taxis, that's like having a fleet of taxis parked outside your house. Each taxi can only go to a specific, you know, specific location. Now, obviously, we know we don't do that because when we want a taxi, we call it up, we tell it where we need to go, and then the next time we'll get a new one. You know, they're really, you know, you have a taxi, which is multi-purpose. It can go anywhere you want to go. Now, when we go back to privileged accounts and look to see how can we overlay this approach, this is where we have an account, we give it a destination, i.e. we say, this is the account we want to use. This is, you know, the permissions. And then the next time we get a new one. But the key thing is, you know, in to use the taxi analogy, there's nothing parked outside your house. The, you know, you're not storing these privileged accounts. They're not hanging around, which means they're not a liability. It means we reduce the attack surface. But at the same time, what we're also doing is reducing the liability because if you don't have them stored in a vault or if those accounts don't have privilege, there's nothing to rotate. So it's a win-win situation. You know, it's really just the turning the thing on its head and saying, look, we've been doing things wrong. We're, all we're doing is we're not making the problem better by putting in the vault. We're just managing the problem. We're not solving the problem. So what we've done here is we've created um, a mechanism that allows people to do their jobs. And this is really what the essence of PAM is. Um, as I mentioned, people think of vaults. People think, yeah, okay, I need something like Cybrog. Maybe they use it in the past. You know, maybe, you know, they've seen demos of Phycotic, you know, and think, yeah, okay, this is what I want. This is what a PAM solution is. But what PAM is in its essence is nothing to do with all the managed accounts. Those are just the vehicles. What PAM is, is the mechanism to create a policy to control who has access to what. It also is a mechanism to audit what those users are doing and then also to control access. So what we've done is built a very simple model. So you have users and groups. These are the people that need to do things in the organization. You have the activities. So these are the things that they need to do. And then the resources is where they need to perform the activities. So the way that we're changing this around is saying that what PAM should be is something that allows people to do their jobs. You have administrators, you know, they could be DBAs, they could be network admins, you know, routers, firewalls, you know, maybe they need access to cloud services. Maybe they're, you know, it's an AD admin. They need to go into active directory using computers. They need to modify group policy. Maybe they're desktop admins, but these are people that need to do jobs. This is a tool that facilitates that. So essentially, you know, when we look at it overall, I mean, it really is a solution that provides very similar capability than the rest of the market. So it does credential management. It does the audit recording. Um, access certification is built into the product. Um, but the key things that are different is the fact that it will reduce the attack surface. It allows you to be able to create the permissions just in time so that you're collapsing that window of potential attack and also making it very, very simple to deploy. Martin, it's Kenneth yeah. here. Just before you carry on, so, so what, you know, there's actually a, a question about this from one of the partners as well. So what we essentially do is we're helping customers to, to overcome an issue that has been around for 20 plus years now. Is that, is that the right the assumption that we have to do that? You know, with all these standing privileges and everybody just have permissions that sit there for years and years and years? 
That's exactly uh, right. You know, and the key thing is, is volts were developed for a different problem. You know, I mean, when you, if you think of how the world's changed, you know, this is like pre-iPhone, you know, pre-mobile device. Um, you know, everything has changed within the world. And yet the core of all of these PAM solutions have remained around the vault, which really, you know, that solution doesn't fix a problem. Those, those, you know, as you say, those privileges are still hanging around. So, um, yeah, so, so if, if, if just just one more, so if, if you take that kind of a very basic level, is that we, we, we remove something that shouldn't be there essentially, but we had to have it there because we needed the access. And now we, and now we can automate that and provide the access when, when there's a need for it. That's absolutely right. And it's fixing the problem at source. I mean, a good analogy, <clears throat> you know, is thinking of a leaky boat. You know, I mean, a, a vault really is like a sump pump. You know, so, yeah, it, it, it fixes a problem, you know, and it rotates credentials and it manages access to those credentials. But, you know, it, with a leaky boat, you know, what you want to do is you want to stop the water from getting in, in the first place. The sump pump is your backup. So, you know, in our case, by essentially removing the accounts and removing the privilege attack surface we're we're really reducing what you even need to vault so it's really fixing it from the outside in addressing the problem head on as opposed to just managing it <clears throat> now if we take a look at some of the you know the competitors i mean i'm sure you're familiar with a lot of these names um, you know, the, the big thing, you know, that's changed recently, as you're probably aware, is Thycotic has uh, merged with Centrify, so that's now Thycotic Centrify. But the key thing is, is all of these vendors have evolved from that simple vault beginning. Um, you know, Cybright was actually one of the first vendors, um, you know, and really sort of instigated, um, you know, that approach. Same with, um, you know, and the, there was also some some people involved in there that came from, uh, you know, that, that evolved with the product that evolved into the Quest product, i.e. now One Identity. So that there's a lot of players that really sort of go back to that. But the, the trouble is, as I said, is all of these vendors really work around the same vault principle. So if we actually do a comparison, in terms of, you know, just looking very broadly. And I know that, you know, with this type of um, chart, it's very easy that, yeah, we have all the, you know, the, the filled, um, you know, circles, you know, and nobody else does. Um, what we're trying to do here is actually be um, sort of quite honest about this. I mean, there's a lot of things that go right across the board. I mean, all of the PAM vendors do service account management. We do it better we, you know we do things very differently in the way that we do it but again it's, it's not an uncommon feature same with privilege tester management same with password management so you know on those three areas we just compete head to head um, but when it comes to things like just-in-time permissions the key word here is permissions every vendor out there is going to say we give just-in-time access which is true just-in-time access is the whole basis of PAM. I'm going to give a user access to something at a particular time for a particular defined period. So every vendor is just in time access. Now, unfortunately, all the vendors, you know, really sort of jump on the bandwagon and say, yeah, we're, we're all just in time. But the key thing is, is the permissions. Do those permissions only exist for that same length of time or is this something where you have a standing privilege so this is something that you know that, that's very unique to what we have the reason we have the full circle and some of the others have a half circle is because of the breadth of the coverage remedian you know does basically just in time for And again, same with Centrify. It just covers, we have to look at breadth of coverage. The other thing that's important here is when we look at the vault choices, and the reason I bring this up and why it's important is, yeah, in Netrix, we, we've got a vault the same as everyone else. We can manage you know, all of those credentials. We can manage all the local admin accounts. But a lot of companies, 
they're using things like Labs, which is local administrator password solution. It's from Microsoft. Um, it's something that could be added to Active Directory, and it allows Active Directory to do management of local administrator accounts. It's a great solution, but it has some gaps, what we always call in the industry the gaps in Labs. But we fill those gaps. You know, we can treat Active Directory like a vault. If you've got a customer that, already has CyberArk and they're saying, yeah, you know what? We bought CyberArk for the vaulting. We've never really implemented PSM because PSM is too expensive and we need all those extra licenses, you know, the Microsoft cows for, you know, for. You know, you can go in, you can adjust access policy on the fly and get real time view in terms of who has access to what. Now, again, you know, just to sort of as a reminder on this approach, in the competitive market, what they're doing is they're managing the problem, they're not fixing it. You know, what they're doing is they are just saying, here are privileges, we're going to put them in a vault. So, standing privilege is that big risk. And I said, ransomware is, is obviously you've probably seen from the news recently, um, it's huge. You know, there's a lot of companies that are even actually building, um, you know, ransomware payouts into their budgets. I mean, it's that big a problem. And the trouble is people pay the money. You know, look at, you know, the, the recent thing with the pipeline. I mean, you know, that company paid out $5 million. And so it's profitable. You know, companies or the threat actors that do it can see that people will pay the money and if there's a market, they will then, you know, commoditize it and start using it. And so, you know, this is a problem that's only going to get worse. So what we're doing here is we're removing the accounts and the privilege that these types of products typically use to propagate. Now, the other big issue as well in the competitive market is it's very confusing because there's a lot of price lists that are frankly like McDonald's menus. You know, I mean, there's bits and pieces everywhere. Do you want this flavor? Do you want to supersize that? You know, it's complex for customers. It's complex and difficult to sell. Um, you know, there's a lot of hidden licensing costs. So, yeah, for PSM, you have to add additional Microsoft cows. You also need RDS servers you know maybe there's database licensing that a customer hasn't considered and then also we have to consider what's the cost of ownership how many ftes how many full-time employees does it take in order to be able to manage a solution and deployment wise you know, obviously it can take a very very long time now our approach is different because we're fixing the problem at source zero standing privilege is what we're going for remove the attack surface make the price model very very simple very understandable it's very easy for people to look at it and also to do comparisons but it also means that we're opening up an entirely different market as well so you know within our research talking to our customers there's a whole base of customers you know mid market that really doesn't have a pam solution because they feel that it's too complicated or it's going to be too expensive or they just don't have the time to learn something they just think you know it is is really going to be a time suck for them and so what we have is something that makes it easy for us to do business with those the deployment can take hours and days to deploy now you might be thinking well from a partner well how do i make my money you know because obviously you know typically with the pam solution you would make money using services the thing to remember with this product is the margin might be lower in terms of what you're going to make per deal but the difference is is high volume this allows you to be able to go out to a very high volume of customers be in and out the door very very quickly implement a PAM solution, which will also give you upsell capability. So, you know, when we look at the, you know, how this integrates with, you know, data access governance, it's, it really is very complementary. And, um, you know, I'll tell you that there's actually a lot of deals that we've closed, um, you know, on the access governance based upon PAM. PAM be, is being that differentiator. So, you know, if we're competing against Veronis or the other vendors that are out there, you know, we've got a product 
that will go out. It identifies, it tells you where your risk is, where's your privilege, you know, and who's using them. But what SP PAN does is it can go out, it can remediate that environment, it can take away, you know, and fix privilege, you know, where it shouldn't be, and also provide a mechanism for people to do their job without creating more privilege. So it's all about privilege risk reduction. So we've got that control and then that feeds back into itself. So you keep reporting and over time, you should see a linear decrease in the attack surface in the organization. And, you know, as I say, just when talking to customers, you know, the big challenge is they have the same problems really right across the board. I mean, ransomware, you know, doesn't necessarily pick a size of customer. I mean, yeah, that there may be some differences there, but there's no different, you know, to a risk to an operation um, you know, if you are a small business or whether you're a large enterprise, you know, if you can operate as a business, you can operate as a business. And so very often people feel that they're, you know, forced to put something in. But the problem is all of the solutions that are out there are very complex. They are very expensive and they tend to shy away. What this is doing is this is giving you an, a, you know, really a new market that makes it easy for, you know, to be able to put it in. Now, a lot of people will also use things like password managers, like LastPass, uh, maybe Manage Engine, um, you know, and really just ways of just being able to store credentials, but it just doesn't go far enough. So there's this really been this gulf up until now where, you know, you've got the two ends of the market. You know, you've got the market where, you know, it's very complex, you know, very um, unwieldy to use. And then you've got the other market, which really just isn't enough. So what I'm going to do is just do a quick um, demonstration of the products, just so you've got a visualization about you know, what it looks like and you know what some of the benefits are. And then um, we've got a few slides that we'll also show at the end. This talks about some next steps and also gives you some information about uh, certification on the product. So please stick around um, after the presentation. And also what we'll do is we'll also um, open up for questions after that. So. What I'm going to do is show you something that's very, very different to, you know, what you're probably used to seeing. When most people think of PAM, they tend to think of this solution that has all of these different managed accounts. The way this product works upon activities. Now, if you're familiar with tools like Okta, you know, and these sort of card-based interfaces, this is something that people naturally gravitate towards because they're simple to understand, they're easy to use. So in an activity, what we do is we say, okay, all right, I need domain admin access. Um, I'm gonna create a session and I need access to this domain controller. Now, what this is doing is this is gonna create an account dynamically. So this isn't using it as just an account that privilege didn't exist before. I'm logged in as Jay Smith and you'll see the account is creating is called J Smith would have a set of random characters. So we've created a unique account for the session with domain admin rights. The user simply clicks a button. This will then log the user in. So now this actually allows the user to be able to um, you know, access that, that session. So now you'll see that the user is being logged in to the endpoint. We're recording everything that's happening. We have certain things, which again, like our advanced features, not all competitors have the ability to extend sessions. We've got a virtual button on the screen. You hit the virtual button, that's now extended your session. Now, the other nice thing as well is that this also allows administrators to be able to see what's happening. So let's say, for example, I log in as an administrator. Um, I can see everything that's going on. So I can see real time all of my users, my resources, what's happening to those. I can also see even what the user is doing on the screen. So in this case, I can see that going in. Let's say, for example, this is a new hire that I'm training up, or maybe this is a remote vendor or contractor, I've got the ability to look over their shoulder. If they're doing something that's bad, I can remotely terminate the session. I also have a capability of lock-in. Now, the key thing about this is, let's say, for example, it's not an active attack, but somebody's doing something they shouldn't do. So I can say, call me on extension 2345. And then what this is doing now, this is now locks the session. So this is now um, preventing the user from you know, really working within this RDP session. It'll be the same for SSH. It's the same for web sessions. But the key thing is, is now this is something operational. So now 
you know, really, you know, that user can call in, we identify is what, you know, that person is doing legitimate. If it is, well, we can unlock the session. The user can carry on and they can do, you know, whatever they were doing. Now, the nice thing here is as soon as that session is complete, it's available for immediate playback. You don't even have to wait for the entire session to finish. So this allows you to be able to watch a video recording of everything that happened within that particular session. We can do the same thing with uh, web pages as well. So it doesn't matter whether it's SSH, whether it's RDP, if I need to log a user into an environment, yeah, I can actually log a user into Azure AD. So this is going in, this is going to access my team board. And then if I want to be able to, uh, to log in as a user, this is now logging me into that particular environment. And what it's also doing is it's also allowing me to be able to see you know, exactly what is happening. So I'm recording all of this activity. So I can go through, I can actually start running reports as a user, but you'll see we're recording everything that's happening. It's giving me a countdown. It's telling me I've got two hours remaining. We've got options like autofill credentials, you know, giving the user to, you know, be able to access, um, you know, certain things like the password if we need to. But the nice thing is, is as soon as the user finishes, you see it cancels. And now it's available for immediate playback again. So whatever the user is doing, it doesn't matter whether it's on a website, doesn't matter whether it's in you know a Linux session, doesn't matter whether you know it's RDP. We've got the capability of recording everything that happens within those sessions. So this is really you know very strong access control. We have service account management. So if I want to be able to manage accounts used to start Windows services and schedule tasks, I can go in. I can see that it's enumerated all of those Windows services, and I can hit a change now button and actually watch as it all happens in real time. So I can see it changing on the domain. I can then see as it pushes out the change and also restarts any services as required. Now, if there's a failure, like you'll see here, we had one that failed before, I've also have a rollback button. This is something that's very, very unique. So what we've done is we've added operational workflow around the whole basis of service account management. And the products will do a lot more, but obviously in the interest of time, hopefully this will give you a little bit of a taster in terms of uh, really what the product uh, is capable of doing. So let's actually go back into the slide deck and you know, really just kind of summarize, you know, the, the basis of what we're doing is that we're saying that, you know, the, all of the access is on the fly and then we remove it when it's not needed. So if you are you know, if you essentially have, um, you know, access to an account or you need to do something for 15 minutes in a day, then for the other 23 hours and 45 minutes, that privilege doesn't exist. It's not a threat surface that can be exploited. And it's all around monitoring, logging, and allowing you to be able to see what all those users are doing. So I'm going to pass it um, sort of over now, um, really, you know, just to sort of talk about some of the uh, certifications. So, um, Eleonora, can you uh, give some uh, context to this, please? Sure. Uh, so, guys, do you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, we would like to remind you, uh, guys, that uh, we have... Um, Netflix SBPM sales and technical certifications ready for you on our partner LMS. Um, this is a very easy online training program uh, that allows you to get the knowledge about this um, solution and um, start selling it right away. Uh, you also get the um, certificate and badge that you can demonstrate to your um, prospects, customers, and peers. So again, uh, just to remind you that uh, in order to get into the LMS, you just need to go to the Netrix Partner Portal, uh, then go to the certifications and choose styles bits, training and certification programs. And from this page, you, you can see the screenshot uh, in front of you. Um, you can go uh, directly into the LMS via the single sign-on and there uh, find the necessary courses. Uh, once you complete them, you will get the certificate and badge and 
We also uh, really appreciate if you uh, share uh, your achievements on LinkedIn. And our network social media team uh, will make sure you are highlighted on our corporate social media pages. Uh, and uh, the training, which is really important, is um, really, um, you know, quick and uh, does not take a lot of your time. Uh, the sales one will take about uh, one and a half hours. And the technical piece, which also has um, the shared of activities with our solutions engineering team, can take up to um, two or three hours. Uh, and if you have any additional questions regarding the certifications, uh, please reach out to Canada myself directly. And on the next uh, slide, please. Um, you can see how our certificates and badges uh, look like. So as you see, um, they are um, signed by our chief executive officer. This is a really um, great piece to share. So uh, we look forward for more uh, SBPAM certified partners. Thank you, Martin, for giving me uh, this opportunity. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so let's um, open it up questions i see that there, there's some questions um that have come into into the chat window um yeah let, let, let me let me give you the questions martin and then you please. can worry about answer so let me start off with one uh is it possible to use multi-factor authentication yes it is so the product has built-in mfa so all you need is a time synchronous token to be able to use it but it also integrates with any third party MFA, you know, either through Radius or direct integration. Uh, we support OpenID Connect, SAML 2.0. So if you're using Azure AD, Ping, Okta, um, any of these, you know, ADFS, any type of technology, even including SSO, we will support those. Wonderful. So I know we are among friends, it's all our partners online, a little bit on, you know, kind of more the future, uh, reporting in Netbook Auditor on activities done by SPPAM. Yep, no, it's a great question. So one of the key things that um, SPPAM does is it uses what we call a service account. So there's always an account that's used for the context of all of its privilege orchestration. Now, what that allows you to be able to do even currently out of the box now is to be able to filter those events. So when you're looking at the who, what, where, and when, um, you can see exactly what events has happened and what's been orchestrated by SBPAM, um, in addition, obviously, to you know what has gone outside of the system. Now, we are working on integration. So one of the things we have coming out um, in the not too distant future is going to be the ability to send a feed of privileged sessions into Netrix Auditor, and that will allow you to be able to even do replay back from the Netrix Auditor interface. So that way, you know, if you look for something, you find something anomalous, and you want to get some context, you can play it back without then having to separately log into SPPAM. So, you know, as a company, you know, there's integrations, um, you know, that we're building really between all of these. The other thing as well as an integration, uh, which will come out probably in the slightly shorter term, is the ability to use SBPAM as a mechanism to rotate credentials. So it will integrate in as an external vault for Netrix Auditor. Hope that answered the question. Uh, just just one thing on, on, on that then, you know, with the integration and the feedback. So basically what we provide now to the customers in, you know, in, in cooperation with our partners is, will be the ability to have compliant teams working on also activities made by administrators, even though they go to a system like SPPAM. Yeah, and that, the, you know what, that is a perfect um, use case, kind of. I mean, so the, the big challenge is the fact that, you know, a lot of companies have different systems. So they've got, you know, your data access governance system, you have, you know, your separate PAM solution, but there are different groups of people that have access to it. So, you know, by building this bridge, if you like, between the systems and allowing, you know, certain people to work within the context of their own system, it allows you to be able to pull the information you need. So that's a really good point because very often what might happen if you think of a typical scenario, you see something anomalous in Netrix Auditor, you then have to go to the PAM team and then say, oh, okay, can you take a look at this session at this date and this time and then give me access? Well, if you don't have access to the system, 
you can't watch the recording. You 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 know really expecting them to look through and looking for the context of what happened. So this really you know a lot of the integration that we can do um, and part of the benefit of our organization having both of these solutions means that we've got something which is you know a little bit more tightly integrated. That's a wonderful answer. I like that part in you know giving the possibility of all our partners to go and in, you know, talk with all the network talk to customers about new possibilities. Yeah. Well, and again, when you think about it, this is a differentiator, you know, when you're in a, you know, in a, in a compete solution um, or a compete situation, you know, really, this is the bit that really, you know, we're very often time tip it over the edge. Uh, you know, we've closed some very large deals, um, you know, against uh, say the likes of Veronis, you know, where we've been able to differentiate with Pam and vice versa. You know, very often you can go in with a net new Pam uh, type of situation and then, that gives you uh, a cross sell opportunity in order to be able to layer on um, you know, the Netrix auditor, you know, on top of that. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, so what if you're a service provider then? Is, is there any future things happening on SPP if you wanted to provide this as a kind of a admin free service to customers if you're running as, as a service provider? Yes. So there's uh, there's some deployment methodologies that you can use right now um, that will allow you to be able to uh, use it within a, in an MSP framework. There is a multi-tenancy release that you know will be developed. Um, and again, not coming out in the too distant future, but what that will allow you to be able to do is really to be able to have something which uh, you know offer this type of solution as a service. Now, the nice thing about the architecture and the design is this is all entirely microservice based so one of the benefits um, you know again compared to other solutions that you know I've built and worked with in the past in the PAM space is you know it allows you to be able to deploy almost just enough agent capability to a customer site so you know rather than putting full-blown appliances you know in every customer site and then you know obviously usually those are tied back to a central database and having those you know things become inoperative when the link goes down we have that capability of being able to distribute um you know the the, the entire architecture whether that's on a you know customer by customer basis or whether that's centralizing this type of solution and have many users share so you know there's depending on the use case there are some things that you can do out of the box now and there are also um you know some very unique differentiating capabilities that are going to come out for the msps in the not too distant future and certainly anybody that has a question about that feel free to reach out to the team and we'll be happy to set up a call to discuss this cool so uh a couple of technical questions. So first of all, minimum system requirements to run SPPAM. So again, great question. I mean, if we take a look at, you know, let's, let's take some examples. So if you've got a very small environment, so SMB, lower bid market, they've got five or less admins or even sort of 10 to 15, so it's not that many. Then, you know, what you'll need is a um, 2019 server, um, eight gigabytes of RAM, and four processors, about you know, 100 to 150 gigs of disk space, depending on, on what you really want to record. So it, it's a very sort of low um, requirement. Again, single server, all the modules are installed on there. Now, as you've got the scale and you get into the sort of 200 you know, admins, really what you're doing is you're just increasing the memory in the disk space. Um, oftentimes, you might go up to eight processors, you know, 16 gigabyte of RAM, and say to four to 500 gigs of space. But then when you get up into the thousands of admins, which again, you know, we support, we got customers, you know, of that size, what, you know, that allows you to be able to do is also use the uh, distributed deployment. So, you know, again, typically, you know, the majority of the, of the services will be run from a single server. Um, you might, you know, in those cases may have to go up to like 128 gig of RAM um, and sort of 16 processors, depending upon, you know, what you want to offload. But in terms of the architecture, you know, the technical architecture that you can distribute, you can move the proxy components to different resources. You can run those on Linux. You can run them in Docker containers. You can offload those to separate systems. Um, the action service, which is the component that does all the orchestration, you can add multiple action services and they will all round robin. So essentially, horizontally, the products 
will just keep on scaling and it allows you to be able to grow. So that way, if you go into an organization um, using, you know, a fairly similar, you know, a limited use case. So let's say, for example, they go in and they say, yeah, I've got about sort of 40, 50 admins that need to be able to use this. Very often what we're finding is customers start using the products and they're saying, you know what, we can use this for HR. We can use this for our network device team. You know, we can use, um, you know, the the organization that uses ESX, you know, and the managing that or the desktop team. And you find it then starts to grow. So the nice thing is, is instead of then having to really, you know, start migrating boxes and add, you know, different pieces of hardware you know, onto that, you can now start scaling out, um, you know, sort of very easy. So we've also thought of the journey, you know, that allows people to get from A to B. Absolutely wonderful. I got yeah, there's yeah, lots of lots of questions popping up right now. So many more to come for you, Martin. Next one is: Is it possible to register mouse and keyboard history during recorded sessions? So that is a roadmap item. Um, it is something that, um, funny enough, it is. It does have the capability of recording at the back end. Um, the part that's on the roadmap it is really just externalizing that. Um, so you know, for a typical session this would be standard in standard out i mean everything that goes through the proxy everything that's typed um now you know when it comes to things like idp sessions um obviously you don't want to be going into um you know ocr and those types of things so the way that we will be doing this um you know similarly to how i have positioned this in previous products that i've built in this space will be a small dissolvable client so it'll be a little agent that gets deployed at session time um it will record everything that happens within that RDP session on that host and the context. So, you know, this application ran and, you know, the user clicked on this particular control, et cetera.